Hi everybody, I am Net Nursing Prof and welcome to my channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about respiratory acidosis. So let's get into it. So how does this work? How does somebody get respiratory acidosis? What happens is you're hypoventilating, which means you're either breathing too slowly or too shallow. So you're not taking those deep enough breaths or you're not breathing, you know, a normal amount. Your respiratory rate is lower. And what happens to these patients is because they're not breathing enough, they're not excreting enough CO2. So carbon dioxide is staying in the body. And when it stays in the body, it starts to change things. When you have an excess of CO2 in the body, it causes a decrease in the pH of the blood. And if you remember the pH scale, the lower the number, the more acidic. And we don't want our blood to be acidic, right? We want our blood to be nice and neutral. So respiratory acidosis causes our blood to become more acidic, which as you can imagine, is very dangerous. There's two types. There's the acute type and the chronic type. So acute respiratory acidosis, this is an emergency. If we don't do anything to help these people, they will die from this. So acute, think emergency. Chronic respiratory acidosis develops over time, and it might not have those obvious symptoms that we're going to talk about. So chronic will develop over time and can become life-threatening later on if we don't do anything to help these people. Now let's talk about the causes. Now let's talk about the causes. For the acute causes, remember these are the life-threatening ones, a lot of these are disorders of the lungs, and that makes sense, right? So things like COPD, asthma, pneumonia, things like that can cause acute attacks, which can cause the person to go into acute respiratory acidosis. Other things, sedative overdose. This is kind of the big one when it comes to nurses. This is why when we're in control of things like narcotics and sedatives, medications like that, that can cause the patient to have decreased respirations, it is our responsibility to monitor and assess those patients constantly for overdose. We need to be careful when we give those medications and we have to make the choice. Do we give them or do we hold them? What's the safest thing for the patient? Because if we give too much in too short a period of time for the patient, it can cause sedative overdose. So they're not breathing very good, right? They're not breathing enough and they can go into respiratory acidosis. So this is very, very important part of our nursing assessment to prevent this. Injury to the head or chest, like the chest wall, or the patient having an obstructed airway. Chronic causes, you'll see the first two are the same as acute because these are more long-term complications of having asthma and COPD. It can cause the blood to become more acidic over time as opposed to like an attack in the moment. Other causes, multiple sclerosis, and severe obesity. So those who are morbidly obese, they have a harder time with chest wall expansion and taking deep enough breaths. So their breaths are usually more shallow. So that could be a cause of respiratory acidosis. A memory tool that you can use to help remember the causes of respiratory acidosis is depress, like depressed respirations. So D stands for drugs. So this could be over sedation with sedatives or narcotics. And also there's another D in here, stands for diseases of the neuromuscular system. So that can impair a person's ability to breathe. E is for edema, specifically pulmonary edema. So too much fluid in the lungs impairs gas exchange in the lungs. So that can cause decreased respirations. P is for pneumonia. R, the respiratory center of the brain has been injured in some way, maybe due to something like a stroke, and that can throw off your breathing. E is for an emboli, so specifically a pulmonary emboli, a PE. 
a blood clot that's traveled to the lungs that can impair your breathing. S, sac elasticity has decreased. So somebody who has COPD will have decreased elasticity in the alveoli. So they have a harder time flexing and opening. So they have a harder time with gas exchange. And then the other S is there are spasms of the bronchial tubes, which occurs in patients who have asthma. So this I thought was a helpful little memory tool to remember the causes of respiratory acidosis. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. So the acute form and the chronic form. For the acute signs and symptoms, a lot of these are gonna make a lot of sense, right? So hypoventilation, so you're not taking deep enough breaths or you're not taking enough breaths. This lack of oxygen can cause lots of problems. Patients might report things like headaches, confusion, blurry vision, overall restlessness. There's this fear, this natural thing we have in our body. When we don't get enough oxygen to our body, the patient knows it. Our body says like, hey, there's a problem here. So they can become restless and anxious. A decreased level of consciousness, they can even go into a coma if we don't do anything to help them. And they can become delirious due to the lack of oxygen to the brain. So this is acute signs and symptoms. Chronic signs and symptoms, these are the ones that develop over time and include things like memory loss, sleep disturbances, fatigue, and personality changes. And usually by personality changes we mean irritability and agitation, usually as a result of the lack of oxygen, the acidic blood, the fatigue, and the sleep disturbances. So they kind of all contribute to these things. So what can we do to help these patients? Let's talk about nursing interventions. Some nursing interventions for patients with respiratory acidosis can include administering oxygen, if you remember, their body is not making enough oxygen. They're not getting enough oxygen. They're retaining too much CO2. So giving them oxygen could help. Encouraging coughing and deep breathing. Suctioning as needed, especially if it's caused by an airway obstruction like mucus. Hold the meds that can cause depression. So our opioids and our sedatives, hold those medications while the patient is acidotic and give them later when they're more appropriate and safer. The patient may need to be put on a ventilator because they're not having a normal time controlling their respirations, so the ventilator will do that for them. We don't always have to do that, but it's an option. Administer the meds, and the meds are going to vary on the cause. So for example, if the cause is something like pneumonia, you might want to administer antibiotics. If it's like pulmonary edema, there's too much fluid in the lungs, diuretics. If it's an asthma situation, bronchodilators and corticosteroids, those are going to help. So the meds we give will be related to the cause. And then finally, education, when they're ready for it. You know, in an acute attack, they're not ready for it. But if they're ready to be educated, they're ready to be discharged home, Things that are very important you want to talk to them about is taking their medications appropriately, and then if they go home on home oxygen therapy, safety regarding oxygen therapy and how to use oxygen appropriately. How is this diagnosed? A couple of different things they're going to want to do. They will do your ABGs, so checking like the pH of your blood. They will do your electrolytes, so your sodium, your chloride, your bicarb, all of that. And then they might even want to do a chest x-ray, depending on what they think the cause is. If they think the cause was a chest wall injury or a pneumonia, things like that, they might want to do a chest x-ray. And then finally, what can we do to prevent this from happening? A couple of things. If your patient is a smoker, encourage them to stop smoking. So smoking causes all of these respiratory issues that we talked about. It can cause COPD, which can lead to this, right? So stop smoking or never start smoking to begin with. 
Maintain a healthy weight. Remember we talked about severe obesity being one of the issues? And then if your patient is taking an opioid or a sedative for whatever reason, make sure they are taking it as prescribed, they're taking it safely, and to never mix these medications with alcohol. Sometimes patients don't know that, so you need to teach them. So we never ever mix an opioid or a sedative with an alcohol because it can cause depression. It can cause respiratory depression. So that was my video. I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. And if not, I'll see you on the next one.